Good morning. Good morning. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 13. It's my hope to get through the whole chapter, but I'm not making any promises. If we do, we'll be in James next week. If we don't, then we'll probably be in James the following week. So, we're getting to the end, though, close to the end. It's a letter to a Jewish church. We believe to be somewhere near Rome. We're going to kind of tackle some things here this week or, or and or next week that are very Jewish in nature, so uh, maybe we'll learn a, a few more things. Some of it we've already talked about. Obviously, this is a, again, this is a, a, a book written or a, a letter written to a Jewish church that's struggling with the idea of the the culture that is around them, the persecution from the culture that is around them. Um, and in that day, the persecution would have been both from the from Rome and from uh, the, the Jews who were holding on to Judaism, those uh, who were still worshiping at the temple. But the temple, we believe, was still intact at this time, that this was pre-70 A.D. Jerusalem was still had not been destroyed yet. The temple had not been destroyed yet. The dispersion had not happened yet. And uh, so there was, especially when we look in the book of Acts, you can see there was there was persecution from both sides of this, from the world, if you want to look at Rome, from the world and from the religious of their time, from the, the Jews, the ones that they had uh, come from, their heritage, the ones who were looking for a Messiah but had missed him. And, uh, you know, and even today we, we still see, still see that it's not a, an easy thing for somebody of, of the Jewish descent to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It's not easy for them. Their families often will disown them, uh, especially if it's Jesus. You, you can pretty much believe anybody's your Messiah except for Jesus. They, they will put up with other people being called Messiah. They won't put up with Jesus being called Messiah. I kind of find that a little ironic that that's, that, that's one more indicator of me that we're right. <laughs> the one guy who is completely wrong for everybody, whose name uh, we've talked about is even attached to cursing among non-believers uh, even people who don't know anything about him, that's all they know about the name of Jesus is that it's attached to a curse. It's, you can't swear without him it, that name there with it. And they don't know who it is or, or why it is. So uh, so let's go ahead and get started. We ended last week with um, With this encouragement, or, well, I don't know how much of an encouragement was, this warning that our God is a consuming fire, that judgment does come with the letting go or the, the disbelief or unbelief of Jesus. The rejection of our Messiah, the rejection of our Savior, the rejection of his word. If you reject the saving grace of Jesus, then judgment's coming. So now the encouragement, he's established very well what we believe, why we believe what we believe. Now we're going to get into our conduct. This is how he's going to close out this letter, this encouragement to godly living, this encouragement to um, holiness. We need to embrace it even today. It's going to be very hard. In fact, it's fought against, it's preached against this holiness, to live a holy life. If you, or I, and I, and hopefully we do, uh, decide to be dedicated to holy living, to living right before God, just that decision alone is, is offensive to everybody else because they know that it is in opposition to what they believe or what they want. They, they don't want part of this. They, don't, they want to be a part of holy living, and just you walking in that way is enough to make them angry, which, you know, for 
the fact or for the rest of the world to preach tolerance, that's a pretty intolerant stance to take. You know, so anyhow, let's just move into this. I'm going to offend enough just going through this first list here without having to tell you why I'm going to offend. All right, so starts right off with let brotherly love continue. And literally the, the phrase there, brotherly love, is Philadelphia. It, it's what it is. It, that's what it means. It's, it's, you know, we have Philadelphia here in our, in our nation. Uh, the, the big city of Philadelphia means brotherly love. It's what it was supposed to be established on. Um, this is what we should be established on, this brotherly love. You can't have brotherly love, though, if you won't interact with other people. You can't express it. And it just means fondness. This isn't agape. This is, this is, you know, the whole term comes from the word phileo. It, it just means a fondness for one another. You just got to like each other. You know, it was kind of a thing in, in my home every once in a while. Me and my brothers especially would push my mom to a point where she would say, you know, I love you guys, but I don't like you very much right now. And we could do that to her. We could, you know, pick at her and... and and be disobedient, but that's not, that's not an option for us really to just say, I don't like you. We, we seem to think that that lessens the blow to say, I love you, but I don't like you. It doesn't lessen the blow. All it says is I love you because I have to, but I don't really want much to do with you. I, I don't want to talk to you. I don't, I don't want to visit with you i don't want to eat with you i don't want to it's not good and it's not okay this is not a negotiable thing and the writer here is saying let this continue which tells us that it was already evident in this church now you know you have the discouragement you have the pulling and the, the conflict that started probably within themselves and their conviction toward the church or toward Judaism and wrestling with that whole thing. And some would be stronger one way, some would be stronger another way. And that was probably con beginning to create some more conflict within the church. Certainly some had probably already left and that was having some influence on, on some that were still there. And so this inner turmoil, not just within themselves. And sometimes this happens with us. Our own inner turmoil with our convictions begins to spill out into everybody else. And we create conflict and turmoil with one another rather than just being nice to each other. You know, we, we look at differences and say, man, I can't, I can't go there. And I, and I don't mean differences as in this is an ungodly act and so I can't go with you. Or, but I'm talking about just, you know, I, I like to hunt and this guy over here likes to fish. And so we can't have anything in common with each other because we're not in the same thing. Some people like sports. Other people can't stand it. And so because I want to watch football on a Sunday afternoon, I can't have people over who don't. Or I know this is going to be a time when I'm, I'm breaking off from my wife because she can't stand football. You know, we, we can't sit in the same room together. We can't tolerate each other for a couple of hours. That's that's ridiculous. Or, you know, I like this team, you like that team, therefore, you know, we're, we tolerate one another, but we're not really friends. We can't be. We have to be enemies over a game. You know, it... Now, that, that excludes U of M and Ohio State. That just is a war that's going to happen every year. So, no, it doesn't. We have to be brotherly, and we have to be loving toward one another all the time. Let it continue. Don't let, the, don't let these little turmoils, these little annoyances, and that's what they become, and that's what they are, and, and sometimes even to the point of, well, you're a Baptist and I'm a non-denominational guy, so we can't do anything together. You know, we can't go there. If we agree on the essentials, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He is the only way to the Father. 
You know, you may believe that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. You may not. Maybe you don't. Maybe you think they've done, they've gone, they passed away. That's not, that's not a salvation issue, I don't think. Do you believe you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Because the Bible says you are. I do. You do. Let's go evangelize people. What's going to save people? That they can speak in tongues or that there's, they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? They've asked him to forgive them of their sins. Well, there's that. Then let's go talk to people and we can do it together. You know, you don't, you don't like the worship service here? Then don't go to the worship service here. Go to one where, where you know and understand and, and, and it's okay. And, and hang on to your traditions. That's fine if your traditions push you in that way. But if it's not an essential, we can't condemn each other. We need to be able to come together. We need to be able to do things. Listen, one of the greatest things and examples I can think of that in our recent history of this church was when we went down to the park with, with Garville Owens. And we went there. Uh, another church from a, a, across the city here went down together. We had two churches come together. He didn't go to either one of the churches. And we went down. We fed people. We delivered the gospel. We ate with people. We talked with people. That's how we have to be. If we can't do that among ourselves, how do we go out in public and do it as a church come together and and, and forget our common ground, which is Jesus in the in the in the Bible, we forget that because we have some things that you know I'm just not settled on this, so I'm not going to do anything with you. I'm not talking about false doctrine. We've been pounding false doctrine for a long time. You, you stay away from them if they're teaching things that are against the Bible or they want to water down the gospel. You know, you, you don't want to go out. It's, well, let me say this. It's not going to work very well. If you're going to go out with somebody who's going to tell everybody that you guys run into that, you know, Jesus will accept you as you are. Don't worry about changing. Don't worry about any of that stuff. And then when it's your turn to open your mouth, you're going, hey, you need to know Jesus. You need to repent of your sin. And and you need to come to, to him and ask for forgiveness. And, and by grace, he's going to bring you up. And he's going to change you. There's two conflicting notions there of what the gospel is, and those don't work together. But even still, this brotherly love, this being kind, this just liking each other, it's not just tolerating one another. It's being able to be interactive with somebody else's life. Even in a church where we agree, we have different personalities. We have different likes, and we have different dislikes, and, and I've already addressed that with the football teams. But, you know, it just... We need to be able to set that stuff aside and understand that we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We need each other. We need to not forsake the gathering together of believers. We need to be here. It's one of the dangers of what we're doing today with the Facebook Live thing. That people think that they can just stay home now. They can, they can go to church online. And... And they don't have to be anywhere. They don't have to come together. They don't need to build one another one another up. That's not a major thing. I can go watch online because I can't find a church in my area. Well, you know what? Use that same internet you're using to stay away from people to find people in your area that have a common ground and come together. Start a Bible study. Right? Don't, but be together. We're told not to forsake this. This is great if you're sick, if you're hurt, if the cars broke down. This is great for that. This is great if you move to a new place and you're looking for a church. It's great for that. It's great for that if you want more Bible study later on and you're going to pull it back up and you're going to and you're going to watch it then. You know, maybe you maybe you have a home church, but you like the study that we're doing now, so you pull it back up. We put the stuff online, we recordings and video as much as we can, but it's not intended to replace the gathering together of believers. You understand this? One of the things the world wants is for us to be divided, to be separate from one another. So that you don't have anybody to build you up. All you have is the junk that they're going to feed you. 
And since you like the online stuff so much, that's where they're going to nail it. That's where it's going to come. Facebook is the only social media that I have, and there is way more destructive junk on there than there is good. And, you know, I'll tell you, most of my friends on Facebook are Christians, and it's still the same junk I get. Very few of us will use quotes from old church fathers or good solid quotes even of of pastors today. Very few of us will use scripture to put out there to encourage anybody. It's take the negative from the media and, and voice our displeasure with everything and then let it go. And then we don't look like or sound like anything different than the rest of the world. And for sure, there are times to say, listen, this stuff, this stuff that's being put out here, this whatever they want to pin it on, it's against God. And, and do you need to voice that? Yeah. I don't, I don't mind sharing articles every once in a while that, that have to do with um, abortion or have to do with same-sex marriage or anything like that. The destructive nature of those things and, and, and other things. It's not limited to those two. I'll put that out there. But it, because the other side of the story needs to be, needs to be told. It, it needs to be heard for sure. But it needs to be in love. I think Paul is in one of the letters to Timothy said that you need to, you have to be able to tell the truth, but you have to be able to do it with love. If you're just going to use the truth of God as some kind of spear that you're chucking at people all the time, just to take them down, then you're not, you're not using it correctly. We've discussed this in, in our study in Job on Wednesday night. There's truth in his friend's statements. But they're using it to convict Job of something that's not there. And their intention in how they use the truth isn't good. And they have to answer to God for that in the end. And God stands them up and says, now you guys, you're going to take your sacrifice. You're going to go to Job and he's going to pray for you. And if you don't, then I'm going to take you out. So they, God, they misrepresent God, even though there's truth in their statements. There was truth in the, in the temptation of Jesus by Satan in Matthew chapter 4. He used scripture to get at our Lord. You know, we can't do that. We have to be loving. Loving's not an option. And there's a warning. Remember when we were going through Matthew, by Jesus himself. The love of many is going to grow cold. That's the agape love. Was going to grow cold in the last days. The worse things get, the more undedicated we're going to be. Because that's what agape means. It's not just godly love. If you ask most Christians, what's agape? Well, that's godly love. That's God's love toward us. That's his grace. That's his mercy. The actual definition of it is is uh, dedication, commitment. It's like an, a super dedication, a, a super commitment. That is God's love toward us. So committed to those that he created in his image that he did send his son, came in the flesh, died on the cross to offer us forgiveness of our sins, resurrected on the third day to offer us eternal life in a resurrection, to give us something to look forward to. But the actual definition is commitment. And Jesus saying in, in that warning to those who were around him, who believed in him at the time, the agape love, the dedication toward others is going to get cold. You're going to back off. You're going to see so much lawlessness, so much that we're just going to withdraw and we're going to pull back. 
Because of lawlessness, he says, be, and, and that's the reason that it's going to happen. Because of lawlessness, the dedication, the agape love of many will, will grow cold. That has got to be a challenge to every one of us. We cannot forget that. Because we see lawlessness all over the place right now. We see our own lawmakers wanting to disregard the law to make new laws that promote lawlessness. And, and they'll disregard the laws that are already on the books to do that. And then you have a conflict, right? So it's not, it's not easy. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be hard for you to let your love grow cold, to pull back. It's going to be easy to do that. It's not going to be easy to stay active, to stay in this brotherly love, just to like somebody, to be that ded dedicated, to be friendly toward one another. And it's another reason why we need to come together because where do you practice it if you don't? At home? Well, that warning's gonna gonna wash over into the house. Your dedication to one another is gonna grow cold. We see it in marriage, and we're gonna talk about marriage in two more verses. That the dedication toward one another is not there. And even the brotherly love is not there in a home. We, we have to. This is an, an admonishment and an encouragement. Let brotherly love continue. Verse 2, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by, doing some, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Entertain strangers. When people come here that we don't know, you guys do a pretty good job of getting to them and shaking hands. And even the ones that are trying to get out you know, as fast as they can. And we have that. We have people that will come and, and that during the last song, they're gone. It's funny. I think around Christmas time, we, we had some visitors. We had people here who weren't always here or not normally here. And it was a decently full house. We'd say, I came down off the stage while we did the last song. I came back up and I looked around and almost everybody was gone. You know, and it wasn't, I don't think, because they didn't like us or whatever. They just had their engagements, and you know how I go. So I probably, I probably, you know, took up some of their time or whatever. But it was just odd to be up here through an hour's worth of teaching and looking at everybody, come down for two minutes, come back up, and I'm like, they're all gone. But we need to entertain strangers, for by doing or so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. And, man, that's the motivation for some people. I'm hoping I'm entertaining an angel. I'm hoping it's an angel, so I'll, I'll say hi to a stranger. That's not entertaining a stranger. You know, it's taking care of them. It's, it's giving them food. One of, the, one of the guys I listened to said it's kind of like God's secret shopper. You know, they just show up. They don't look the way we think they're going to look. They're not all bright and shiny, waving a sword. They're not, you know, that's what we think of. We think angels. We go to spiritual warfare and our buddies and the, and the chariots of fire in the hill that Elijah saw and all of that. That's what we think of when we think of an angel. Could just be somebody who wanders in and doesn't quite look right and Maybe even acts a little off-putting and just to see if you're willing to reach out. It's a, it's like God's secret shopper. You know, the guy that goes into the store and sees if the customer service is there or not. It's not about price when they go into shop. It's about how is the customer service. Well, how is our service to the, to the world out there? And I, and I get, man, it's it's very shady sometimes. There's a lot of shady characters out there. But even still, do we reach out to them? 
you ready to reach out to the shady ones. Yeah. Uh, think about how many people we've had come in and never come back. They didn't have anything bad to say. Didn't like run out of here like they were on fire. But they've come in here and then they've they've left and they've never come back. We've never seen them in the community again. You don't see them anywhere again. What if some of them were angels just checking us out, man? Just to see if we were willing to practice what we preach. We don't know. Abraham entertained angels. Remember, they came with the Lord. He made meal for them. He, he, he and Sarah, you know, were hospitable toward them. When they came to Sodom and Gomorrah, to Lot, Lot was hospitable, took him into his home. Ended up taking really making sure they went into the home because of protection. He wanted to protect them. He knew it was a dangerous place. They were angels. And there's others. You know, we need, now not every stranger that comes into your life and then just fades off into the distance and you never see him again. Not every one of them is an angel. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not pushing that. We, we get, take this verse and people will just take this verse to such an extreme before long, they're angel worshipers. And we're not that. I don't even want everybody that comes in here who's a stranger to be an angel. Angels aren't going to get saved. You know, they're an opportunity once in a while for us to, to, practice on and, and want to make sure the love is still there and like I said seeker shopper kind of attitude but people are going to come in with the same look looking for love looking for some kind of acceptance now they're going to get the truth when they come but they got to get the truth in love you know, I, I've told you before you know, I've had friends that, that will say, you know, we changed the way we do things at church. When You know, we're not telling people about hell anymore. We're not telling, you know, because people won't come in and stay for that. Well, when do you tell them the truth then? You have to teach about sin. You have to teach about judgment. You have to teach about those things. And if you're worried about doing it all the time, don't do it all the time. Follow the scripture like we do, verse by verse through the Bible. You teach on it when it's there. You leave it alone when it's not. But the reality of it is, is you guys need to know about it. You need to know how to deliver it. You need to know how to talk to people. And you need to be willing to talk to people. And it's so, how many times do you go to the store and you just kind of keep your eyes down and you know where your stuff is, you run to that, you run back out. Hopefully nobody talks to you. Especially, ladies, if your hair's not done, your makeup's not on, you just want to get in and get out before somebody you know sees you. All right? That's not the attitude we're supposed to have walking around here. We're supposed to entertain strangers. If you if you live your life that way, so just with this tunnel vision, I just got to get to, from point A to point B, you're going to miss those who have need, who are around you, needs that you can meet. You know, a couple of years ago, just driving through the parking lot up here at the store, there's a, a lady sitting out underneath one of the pine trees up there, and I noticed it looked like belongings, like suitcase, and a kind of a broken down vehicle, and I just pulled up because she was, it was hot, and so I'm like, I can't, I can't just drive past this. I asked, hey. You okay? Everything all right? Yeah, yeah. My husband's in the gas station trying to give us a couple things, but just, you know, things not going well. Things are not doing good. Didn't ask for a ride anywhere or anything. They had a vehicle. Like I said, they, they had a vehicle there. And I'm just like, all right. And I pulled off, and I, I can't. So back into the store. I went into the store. I grabbed some some food there for them, and, that, you know, they have the – chicken and stuff at the deli or whatever that's already prepared and I just took it back and said here this, I'm a pastor I can't let this go here you go here's some food for you guys you're sure you're going to be out right? here's some water you're gonna, you know it's hot make sure you're drinking water and uh, 
I've never seen him again. It doesn't matter. I, I couldn't leave that. I couldn't leave that situation untouched. And, and you, we cannot become so tunnel vision, so point A to point B, that we don't see the needs that are around us that we can meet. Now, I don't tell a story so everybody thinks I'm a great guy. How many, I don't know how many people I've blown past because I'm not looking or thinking. How many opportunities have I missed? So I pray just about every Sunday morning for God to put opportunities in front of us, let us see the opportunities, and then give us the boldness to go after those opportunities. And most of the time in my mind is I'm thinking, let us speak the truth to them. Let us share the gospel with those opportunities. And those are the kind of opportunities that I'm, I'm, I'm praying about, usually on my mind, because I want people to get saved. But how many chances have we missed just to be kind to somebody? Whether we know them or not. And yet, you know what? They might make you late for something because you're going to say hi and you're going to get an entire life story about how bad things are. And that's when you say, you know what? I'm a Christian. Let me tell you about Jesus. And if they won't hear it, say, well, at least let me pray for you. And don't be afraid to do it in the store. You know, I've prayed for people in the store. Richard, Richard brought a friend to me a few months ago in the store, in the in the meat section. We're standing, can you pray for her? She needs you to pray for her right now. Not even somebody who believes in Jesus. You should have seen the look on her face. Richard, I don't know if you really realized that, but they were like, um, they weren't very comfortable. Richard was perfectly comfortable with it he knew what they needed now Richard could have prayed with it himself he didn't have to bring him to me but he knew what they needed they needed prayer so you have me and Richard praying for somebody in the meat section at the store you know don't Hospitality. Hospitality was huge in this culture. It's huge in that same area of the country or the world still today. Hospitality in the Middle East is huge. You know, I, I've had a, a, a Muslim. Uh, well, he's not Muslim. He, he's converted from Islam to Christianity. And he said, one of the ways that if you want to get their ear is when you, if you have a Muslim neighbor move in, invite them over for dinner, feed them, be hospitable to them. Now he knows what Islam says and he knows what Sharia law is and all that, but he said it, even still in this day and age, if you'll do that, you got a friend. They're going to want you to come over. They're going to have the, uh, an opportunity to return the kindness to you. Would you do it? It's kind of hard right now, isn't it? But it's an opportunity to reach out. You want them to listen to what you have to say. You be kind. You be hospitable. Hospitality is huge. And it's not just between our religions, between Christianity and Islam. If you, you want to do that with a, a Muslim, that's, that's just an, a, an example of how this works. But other people, you know, they don't have to be, you know, this, this isn't uh, intended to be a how to witness to an, a Muslim bit here. This is what we need. This is how we put the kingdom out so people really know. Because all they know is what the media tells them, and it's all a bunch of lies. So, anyhow, be hospitable. Remember the, the prisoner. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them. Now, we have a lot of people who are involved in, in prison ministries, not here with us locally, but I've been in, kind of involved with them and supporting them. I've been in a jail to preach before. We used to support Chaplain Larson up there in, in Forgotten Man Ministries, and I think they still do in Kalamazoo. 
in a huh? And Cass, they got forgot forgot man. So, you know, we try to support those ministries, but you know, we we do have there are Christians who are in jail. Maybe they converted while they were in there. Maybe they were prodigals, got themselves in trouble, ended up in there, and had the lights come back on. You know, and even I mean, it's not even strictly related to just the the believers who are imprisoned, but even the non-believers. There, there are guys and they're trying to figure out what went wrong. Where did I go wrong? And they're a captive audience, man. They don't have time to do anything but, I mean, they got all the time in the world. Let me say that. They're, they're not so busy. They got all the time in the world to read what you give them, to, to hear you speak. They're not going anywhere. So you have that. But I want to, uh, my thing, and, and, and part of what I think because of the time that this is addressing, the time of great persecution, the time of Christians being imprisoned, even, you know, we look at Paul's letters to the churches, when we, the ones that we know for sure are his, and um, uh, many of his letters were written from prison. And today we have many, many brothers and sisters imprisoned, not because they did something wrong but in prison because they believe. Pastors and in, in churches being arrested in China today. You know? I heard one person say, most of your Christmas lights are made by your brothers and sisters who are imprisoned in China. And you're wrapping them around the tree and you can't get enough on there. You gotta get them just right. You gotta have the right colors. They gotta blink at the right thing you know whatever that's what you're worried about you know what when you're putting them on you should be praying for your brothers and sisters who are imprisoned in china you know we we just went to prayer for quite a long time for the the pastor who was arrested in turkey until he was released it's it's all over the place People are imprisoned for their faith, you know. And and you know, sometimes I think people get a little down because I want to bring up the persecuted church and and I talk about the persecuted church and it's all over the place and people don't don't want to hear about it so much here because we like not being that persecuted. Well, it's common, first of all, to hear. And sometimes we win small wars, like the guy out in Colo- in Colorado that that had his case dropped, you know, for the second time. But we have other people who, you know, was it Oregon or whatever that couple that lost their business, and in Florida that have lost their businesses, and other places that have lost their livelihood and their provision for their families because of their faith. Yeah. You know, you got people who want to speak the truth that are is contrary to what the world wants, and they go to Facebook jail. <laughs> That's not the same thing, but you know, remember them like you're imprisoned with them. All over the world, in Africa, in Europe, in China, people are imprisoned for their faith. Remember them like you're chained with them. When they suffer, we suffer. It's easy to understand that that principle when somebody is sitting right next to you and they're weeping over a loss of a loved one or they're weeping over a doctor report. And and so it's really easy because you're, you're hands-on with that to enter into that mourning with them. But it's harder when we know that we have brothers and sisters. They're not in our face all day long they're not on our mind all day long and so i need to keep bringing up to you the persecuted church you need to know that these things are happening all over the world we still live in a place where it's free we're free to come to a place to gather to you know to share the word to encourage one another and to pray together for our brothers and sisters all over the world Saw a statistic this weekend. 11 people every day lose their life for the faith. 
We have 11 martyrs every day. That's the average. So that means some days there's not so many, some days there's way more than that. But that's the average, 11 martyrs a day for their belief in Jesus Christ. You know, it's time to, it's time to get out of the, the comfort zone. It's time to stop just throwing up, you know, mentions of, of prayer. Just mentioning, oh, Lord, you know, be with the persecuted church and then move on to the next thing on your list. Man, enter into prayer for them. When the first church did that, an angel came in, woke Peter up, and blew the doors open and walked him out. Because there was a group of people that were in in deep prayer for him. Because they'd seen one of their others. James had been martyred already. And that was the intention toward Peter. You know, we we look at the the story of Paul and Silas and they're in jail and they're singing the praises of the Lord and an earthquake happens and the doors come off and they walk out with the jailer. The jailer's like, hey, oh no, he's going to take his life because everybody's escaped and now I'm going to die. And Paul says, nobody's left. Nobody's left here. So he takes them and he cleans them up and he listens and his, he and his family are converted. And then Paul ends up still before the, the magistrate. and Like, hey, well, we're not leaving here. We're going to stay. They're going to come down and they're going to let me go. You know, but we look at that and it's, isn't that awesome? You can be in such a horrible situation. You praise the Lord, man, and he moves and he breaks it open for you. Well, guess what, man? Peter was asleep. Peter slept a lot. Peter's in jail, sacked out. Maybe this is my end. Maybe I get to go home with the Lord. I'm going to sleep. I'm all right. Not full of anxiety, not pacing, whatever. He's out. Out so much the angel had to shake him. He didn't just wake up because his bright light showed up in his jail cell. He had to come up and say, hey, dude, get up. Come on. And the whole time, Peter's so groggy, he doesn't even really know what's going on until he gets outside. And then the church is praying so hard and was and so intense that when he comes and knocks on the door, the girl answers the door, sees it's Peter, slams the door in his face and goes in to tell everybody. She didn't even bring him in the house. And they're all like, no, 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 it can't be true. They they, they don't even believe what they're praying for. That the answer came the way they hoped it would. And, you know, then they see Peter and everything's cool and everything's good. We need to enter into deep prayer for these people like we're chained to them. You can't forget them. Those who are mistreated, remember them. Remember those who are mistreated. There are many people that are mistreated, abused, neglected. And let me tell you something. This is not the negative garbage that I'm talking about on social media. When these things come up, these are the people you should remember. This isn't the junk on social media that we see the reports on abused and neglected people or we see those reports on the persecuted and the the imprisoned. I'm talking about the junk that promotes godlessness. This stuff you need to see. This stuff you need to be aware of. This is the stuff you need to, to be in deep, prayer about you cannot forget these people it happens they're mistreated they're neglected and again it's not just in our immediate area there's a ton of it in our immediate area there is in every area i don't care if it's big city little city rural area 
the mistreatment of other people is something that is huge. It's part of the lawless attitude of our culture, of the world's culture, not just American culture. We're still the ones who rush in to help when there's some kind of national or, or emergency or natural disaster or whatever, and not just even at home, all over the world. It's the Christian organizations that are there first. It's, it's hundreds of people rotating in and out to help. It's not just our culture that mistreats people. It's all over the world. And we're not just talking about believers being mistreated. Abuse and neglect is huge. You know, my wife shared a, a, a thing that was on social media the other day, an article about a panel of judges in Europe somewhere that reversed a rape conviction because the woman was too ugly to have it actually be true. That was the reason for the judges, the judges to reverse the conviction. Huh? In Italy, panel of five judges reversed the conviction and that was their reasoning for it. Couldn't possibly be true. She was, she was too ugly. Why would anybody want to do that to her? That's, that's insanity. That is the insanity in our world today that brings about all of the neglect and, and, and abuse that goes on. That's the way of thinking from the top to the bottom. And you, you can look at it in politics. You can look at it in, in, in the judiciary sense. You can look at it in the personal lives of people. It is that is what it is. We, we hear and see stories all the time of children, babies being tortured to death. But here's the deal. If it only incites rage inside of you, if it only incites anger inside of you and does not drive you to tears on your knees before God, then what good is your resistance to it? Even voicing anything about it. Even at the mention of these stories and these instances that I've just done, probably it, it can, I can feel it building in me to have to talk about it. I can see the look on some of your faces, the disgust, the anger with mankind. So what are you going to do with it? You're just going to post a bunch of vengeful words and, and hell's not hot enough and you can't stick them in a deep, a deep enough dungeon? or whatever your attitude toward it is, or are you going to get on your knees and, and let this turn to mourning for those who are abused and neglected and prayer for the change of heart of men who are carrying out the deeds? Listen, I'm one who's quick to anger. I have had to fight with that my entire life. And I have to surrender to, to God to let his compassion build up in me toward both the abused, both the victims and the ones who are perpetrating the crimes. Now, he's not talking about the ones who are carrying out the crimes here. He's talking about the victims themselves. But we have to. We have to remember that. For sure, the victims should make us mourn for the condition of men. And aware that our own, when, when, the, when the anger, when the rage comes up in us, to realize then, because you can go there, Man, you're only half a step away from being the person who carried out the crime to begin with. Vengeance is not yours to take. It is God's. And believe me, hell will be hot enough. 
if that's where they end up, if they don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, then those who make victims, you can't imagine what they will see when they face God on Judgment Day. It, it Trust the vengeance to God. You don't need to imagine it. If you, if you do imagine what people should deserve, remember this, that without Jesus, you'd have the same punishment, even if you never committed those same crimes. The same thing. It's hard to deal with. It's hard to think of. It's hard to entertain. That kind of imagination. Now, how does somebody take themselves to that level that they can do those things? And quite often what we find out is it's it's a perpetuation of abuse and mistreatment in their past. That has taken them, to, because they've lived through it as a victim, now they're continuing in it as the one who's carrying out the crime. And so what we need to pray for is for that kind of continuance of that kind of sin needs to be broken. And it's broken when a victim can overcome what's happened to them. And so we need to remember, whether we like it or not, God doesn't call us to be comfortable in our thoughts and in who we pray for. He calls us to be in the dirt with Him. Verse 4. Just when you thought maybe things might start getting better. Here's another hard subject. Marriage. Not something that is respected. And not just in our culture. Again, this is a worldwide problem. Marriage is honorable among all. It's not given honor among all. But it should be honorable among all. This is an honorable thing. A husband and a wife. This is honorable before God. It's not seen that way. Fewer and fewer people these days get married. You know? It, it's honorable among all. Th this is a sacred thing. This is a relationship we know from Ephesians that God has chosen to convey or to uh, to show um, his relationship, the relationship between Christ and the church. He's referred to as the bridegroom. The church is, re is referred to as the bride. Paul said of the Corinthian church, we make fun of the Corinthian church. Remember all the things he had to address in the Corinthian church, all of the immorality that he had to address from the way they worshiped to the way they lived their daily lives. But he said it was his desire to present them before God as a chaste virgin. Marriage needs to be honorable to It's valuable to us, to God. In fact, the word honorable there, Peter uses in his writings, the, the same word is translated precious. Not just honorable, but precious, valuable. How do we hold our marriages? Are they valuable to us? Are they precious to us? Are they something we want to have no matter what? Are they something we're going to hold on to? We're going to protect. Marriage among all is honorable. And listen, it wasn't. It wasn't a real different culture back then. 
In fact, maybe, well, I don't know, maybe the same attitude just defined a little more. But for the Roman, it was said that every free Roman man should have a wife for legitimate children, a concubine for pleasure, and a mistress for adventure. That was their attitude toward marriage. That is not a lot different than ours, is it? So the, the the actual uh, cultural response to marriage is not that different. That has been an attack forever. Started in the garden. God brings Adam and Eve together. The temptation is to add, uh, to Eve first. Did God really say this? He wasn't just calling into into doubt what God said. He called into doubt her husband's words relating God's word to her. The temptation was to be in control. Hey, look, it's good for food. I already took a bite out of it. I'm not dead. The division was already starting. When When the Lord shows up, Adam, what have you done? Did you eat from that tree? It's the woman you gave me. Right? Boom. The bond is broken. Right in the garden. This has been an important bond since the beginning of time. Because it showed unity. It was unity lived out. A complete unity. God taking and making Adam from the dust of the ground and then taking Eve, a part of Adam, out of him and making her. And then saying, for this reason, a husband and a wife will come together and will be joined together and they'll be one. It's honorable among all in the bed undefiled. That's part of the honorable. The bed is undefiled. The intimacy between a husband and wife does not defile people. And and that's been a thing also. Even in that culture, you had those who said that marriage was immoral. That you should seclude yourself from one another. You shouldn't interact with. and, And it was an immoral thing. But then you had the, you know, the Romans who... Hey, go sleep with anybody or you have these things. And the Jews weren't any different. Remember when the Pharisees came to Jesus? You know, what do you think about divorce? Knowing that they were divorcing women for any reason. And Jesus said only for sexual immorality, only for fornication. Not even adultery. He didn't say adultery because you know what? They didn't think it was wrong for you to go sleep with a concubine. It was only adultery if you went and slept with a, a married Jewish woman. You could sleep with, sleep with a Greek woman. You could sleep with a, a prostitute. You remember when they brought the woman caught in adultery or caught in prostitution? They only brought her. I suspect the man was probably standing right there. But she's the only one they wanted to stone. The, the the look, the opinion of that intimacy between a husband and a wife and what that brings into the relationship. You know each other in a way nobody else is supposed to know you. You know secret things of one another. You you leave a part of yourself with that person. And I I've heard and I don't know how true this is, but I, I've heard even now they've di- they've discovered that you begin to have your DNA come together. It's not even just through your children. 
you start taking on the DNA of each other. It becomes a part of each other physically, scientifically. We are literally becoming part of the people that we're, in, that we're intimate with. When we're that close, you can speak for one another. You know, it's all fun and romantic. Oh, he finishes my my sentences before I can get them all out. Or she finishes my sentences. Listen, my wife can speak with my authority. I can speak with it for her. And if I, I say, hey, man, I need to check with her. It's because I know me and I know I've forgotten something. I want to make sure before I make this decision to go over here with my buddies that I haven't got something else on the calendar. It's not because I have to have her permission to go do it. Because, man, if there's nothing else going on and I want to go fishing with my buddy, I just say, hey, all right, so I'm going to go take off. I'm going to go fishing with Ron for a little while. All right. Go ahead. But it's that desire to make sure that I'm not in opposition to her that makes me check with her to make sure we're on the same page. We've done this parenting thing long enough that she pretty much knows what my reaction is going to be and she can dish out parameters or groundings or whatever else without my permission, without me standing right there. And we talked about that stuff before we got married. But the bed needs to be undefiled. And and the point here wasn't really so much that the bed needs to be undefiled. I think there's an assumption here, the way this is worded, that they weren't going against God. They weren't committing adultery and fornication. They needed to understand and know, hey, listen, it's not immoral to be married. It's completely moral and right and, and encouraged by God. One man, one woman, together forever. That's the picture, man. That is the picture. That agape, it's really, it encompasses all of of the words of love. Uh, They had, in the Greek, they have four words for love. Not like we have one word for whatever kind of love you want to express. They have storge, which is your love between, you know, family love, like mom and dad your kids, your siblings, that kind of family bond love. You have phileo, brotherly love, where you like people, you're fond of them. You know, Peter was kind of learning a lesson with that one. We go back to this story of after the resurrection, he takes the guys fishing, and they have that whole episode with the bringing in the fish, and Jesus is on the shore, and he feeds him, and then he says, hey, Peter, do you love me? Do you agape me? And Peter is humbled and says, Lord, you know, I phileo you. I love. I like you. And and he asked him that twice. Do you agape me? Are you are you still dedicated to me? Because remember, he was gonna he was gonna die with Jesus. Took Malchus's ear off, and then abandoned him, and then shows up at the in the courtyard, and then denies him three times. And so twice Jesus says, are you still that? Are are you that committed to me still? Do you agape me? And Peter's like, Lord, you know. He knows his failure. You know I like you. And the third time Jesus says, Peter, do you like me? And it hit him in the heart. He says, Lord, you know all things. He knows the extent of your love toward him, my love toward him, your love toward your wife. And you have the the Eros love, the intimate love between a husband and a wife, only to be expressed in that arena, in that relationship. Those four different kinds of love. All of that interacts in that relationship between a husband and a wife. All of it.
But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. And fornicators, man, that's all sexual immorality. All of it. Anything that is against God's definition of pure sexual activity, which is one man, one woman, undefiled. That is a bed undefiled. Anything outside of that. And there's a whole list of it now. We have decided that we can do anything to anybody or with anybody we want to. It doesn't matter. We came from animals. We're going to act like animals. And that is wrong. You see the evil in evolution there? You came from an animal. You might as well act like one. It promotes the lawlessness in, the, in, in our culture. And it promotes all of the sexual immorality in our culture. And in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and Ephesians chapter 5, Paul lists it off. All of the immorality, all of the sexual immorality of any kind. Fornication is a broad word. And adultery is, is a pinpointed word. All of it. God will judge. People say, no, well, that's hate, man. You're taking what I what I like and what I want to do, what I decide is okay, and you're telling me that it's wrong. I'm telling you it's wrong before God. doesn't matter if it feels good. I'm sure it does. I'm sure you take pleasure in it. <laughs> Not all things that bring pleasure are good, and God will judge it. All of us are going to give an account for what we've done with the things that God has given us. And, and intimacy is meant to be pleasurable. Now, he made it. But it's within, for it to be honorable, it's within certain constraints. And that constraint is between a husband and a wife. Not every man and every woman. Not any man or any woman. One man, one woman together forever. That is the beautiful picture of what this is supposed to be. You know, you go back into 1 Corinthians 2, you find out it's not something that you're supposed to withhold from one another. You're not supposed to use it to... to uh, manipulate one another. It, it is what it is. It's meant to bring together and to be honorable before God. You want to see some people get a, a, a little uneasy? Meet with a couple who's getting ready to get married and tell them, you need to pray for this part of your, of your marriage. And, and ask God to bless it. <gasps> He's going to be there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've used that to scare kids in youth group. Hey, you think you're getting away with something? God's everywhere, man. He sees everything you do. <gasps> yeah. By that expression, I know. You already thought you were getting away with something. You're not. God wants to be a part of that. He wants to bless it. So keep it something that's worthy of his blessing. And it's within his guidelines. One man, one woman. And if you want to honor God, that's where it's going to be. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Right? Learn to be content. Don't be covetous. I don't have to have this toy over here. I don't have to have that over here. He's got a red one. 
I'm going to get a yellow one. I can't wear the same clothes that she's wearing. I can't, or I'm going to wear the same clothes, or I want this car, I want that car, we need that house, I need this, I need that, I can't have enough before I'm happy. Why do you think we have hoarders? It's where it ends. Buried in your stuff without Jesus. Now, I don't mean to make light of that, but that's where it ends. You're not taking it with you. Remember, we looked at Peter's letters a couple weeks ago. Everything's going to burn. It's all going to be gone. Be willing to let it go. It's okay to have stuff. It's not okay for stuff to have you. And it's not okay for the desire of stuff to have you and to be your motivation. It's not okay for that. Learn to be content with what you have. Now listen, if something needs to be updated, update it. Something needs to be fixed, fix it. Don't let things fall into disrepair on this. That's not what it's saying either. And it's not saying you can't move into a nicer house or a nicer neighborhood or you can't drive a nicer car. It's don't let it have you. Don't let that be your motivation. Your motivation is the kingdom of God. Your motivation is saving people. Not that you get to save them, but being putting the words out, putting the gospel out. That's our motivation. And our motivation, our stuff, the things that we long for are supposed to be in heaven. Jesus said, store up for yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust can't destroy, where thieves can't break in and steal. Store it up there. And again, he said, what, is, what profit is it? What do you have if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? What good is it? It's, it's no good. Man, go after Jesus. Store things up in heaven. I'm not telling you not to have a retirement plan. I'm not telling you not to save. You should do that. The Bible teaches those things, to, to save, to be prepared. But to be a prepper, it's one thing to have stuff in case of an emergency. You have a tornado hits, you need some extra water, whatever, the lights go out. Oh, that's different. I'm talking about these people who have basements and bunkers and everything full of food that's going to last them for seven years or more. And enough ammo to wage their own war. Well, what does the Word of God tell you to do with the things you have? What did we just look at? Is, is the idea when you do that kind of thing to entertain strangers? Right? When the apocalypse happens, people knocking on your door, are you going to feed them? Are you going to take them in? I'm do that, then we're all going to starve together. Right? Somebody comes around, you got barricades up, you got fences up, you got alarms going, you got guard dogs everywhere. It is every man for himself. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that is not the mentality you're supposed to have. Sorry. It's not. You care for people. Listen, there, there's a movie, and, and I can't say that I highly recommend it because it's a little rough, and 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 that's probably it's a, a rated R movie. So not probably good for children to watch, but it's called Defiance. It's based on a true story of brothers in in Germany, Jewish brothers. And when the Gestapo started coming in and taking over, they came in, they killed their parents, their brothers weren't home. They all run off into the woods. They're just gonna survive out there. They're gonna they're gonna take care of things out there. They'll live, they know the woods, they can survive. And pretty soon more people start showing up. And then more people start showing up. And they'd go off to try to find food. And, then, and whoever went out to try to find food came back with more people. And they're like, how are we going to feed everybody? How are we going to... You know? And these brothers took care of their, their friends. 
people that took care of strangers, people they didn't know. It's not an easy movie to watch. But the story is a pretty amazing story. And there's all kinds of stories like that from that time in that place where people hid Jews. When I watch these shows about these preppers, there's no secret rooms to hide the people that people are looking for. And, and it's not survival in that, you know, if I only eat a little bit every day, I'll be okay. It's like I'm going to live comfortable for these seven years that I'm hiding. Which means in America, you're going to live in abundance that seven years you're hiding. What happens if you take one of those warheads right on the head? What happens when your neighbor becomes really hungry and desperate? To the point of willing to do anything to you to get your food. See where all this goes wrong? Don't be covetous. Be content with the things that you have. And here's how you can be content. Are you looking forward to the day Jesus comes back? Are you looking around at the signs that are there for us in in the world? The formation of the nations who will attack Israel from the north, and they're there. They're on the northern border now. The unrest and the division all over the world and and governments and organizations promoting the division so that people become desperate. And the only way to rectify everything is to give all the power to one guy who locks it all down. And the advancement in technology that Daniel talked about. Holy cow, they're afraid that their AI is going to get away from them and decide they're obsolete and start taking them out. Imagine that, creating something that's going to turn on you. How ironic is that? Man wants to play God, and now they're afraid of what they've created. Difference is our God is not afraid of what he's created. And it's happening. It's happening. China has a news anchor, a woman, and a man that are robots that give the news. And you can't tell. If you don't know what you're looking at, you can't tell. You don't have that autom- automatron voice, you know, that you get. It's not that. Well, for crying out loud, oh, Surrey doesn't even have that, really. Or is losing it more and more. So they're afraid of all that. You got that going on. You got natural disasters everywhere happening. The whole earth is groaning in labor pains for the sons of God to be redeemed. It's happening. You know, listen, God held people responsible for knowing the time of his first coming. It's going to hold us responsible for knowing or not knowing the time of his second coming. And if the prophecies that foretold his first coming were literally fulfilled in him, then the prophecies foretold of his second coming are going to be literally fulfilled in him. Pay attention. It's not going to be easy. Jesus says it's not going to be easy. The writer of this is not telling these people it's going to be easy. He's writing to a persecuted church. Living life that is honorable to God is not easy. It means resisting ourselves, our own desires, keeping things honorable that are supposed to be honorable to God, keeping them that in spite of everything around us. Temptation, influence, bad teaching, all of that promotes godlessness. The writer here is saying you keep your godliness. Be holy, for I am holy, with the promise at the end, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Doesn't matter how hard it gets. Doesn't matter how desperate you think you are or you feel like you're becoming. He won't leave you. He's there. And it's not something you get to feel. It's something you have to know. 
I don't feel like God's here. But do you know he's there? Well, yeah, kind of. No, 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 no. Do you know? Do you know the promise? I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. The response to that is verse 6, and we'll end there. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. If you're living an honorable, godly life, what can man do to you? Well, you just said, man, they can put me in prison. They can kill me. Yeah, so? I mean, prison's tough. I'm not trying to belittle this at all. Torture to death, not a good thing. I understand that. But in the end, what are they going to do to you? Kill you? Your last breath here is your first breath with the Lord. What they think is the worst thing they can do to you. It's the greatest thing they can do for you. Put you in the presence of God. That's why our brothers and sisters who are martyred every day can stand with confidence knowing that when it's done here, when these lights go out, the brightest light they've ever seen is going to be right there with them. Live like that. Live like that. Love one another. Defend your marriage by living it honorably according to God. Defend your family that way. Influence your neighbors by being content with what you have. By entertaining them. Brotherly brotherly love. Right? Like each other. Be kind to one another. Be gentle with one another. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your encouragement. And a reminder, Lord, that we cannot get caught up in this world. We need to be focused on you in order to live a life that is honorable to you, that you can use to, that you can use as an example to bring others to you, Lord, that you can work through. But, Lord, it's even more than that. It's so that we know your promise is true. And so that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? People will be in opposition to all that you've said. The father of lies will will be sure of that, will inspire that. But, Lord, you are almighty God. If we walk with you, what can man do with us? And Lord, be we're thankful that you are faithful to walk with us even when we stumble and fall, even when we're not walking with you. You never leave us. You never forsake us. And for that one-sided promise, we are so incredibly thankful. In Jesus' name, amen.